So let's look here inside of chapter 2. And inside of chapter 2, I would look at the top of page number 39 where it says Pueblos. So under Spanish rule, I would make a little note here at the top of page 39, ownership of all the land was owned by the king. So the king of Spain owned all the land in California. Now, of course, eventually we realized we could not have a situation where one guy just like owns everything. So we needed a system of private property ownership. And if I can just draw your attention to page number 41, you'll see on page 41 this chart of all of the landowners in California. Now, I would note that the largest landowner in California, of course, is the private sector. So the private sector owns 51% of all the land in California. Now, the federal government is a close second at 45%, and state and local municipalities own about 2% apiece. But if the question on the test were to say, the largest landowner in California is who? Your answer, the private sector, right? Remember, the private sector owns 51% of the land in California. I would come back here to page number 40, and at the top of page number 40, you'll see a couple things that are worth noting at the top of page 40. The first thing I would look at is the term common law. So all of our real estate laws historically come from English common law. So again, that could be a question that you might find on your test. Historically, all of our real estate laws in California come from England, right? English common law. Now, there is an exception to this, of course. The exception is community property. And you'll see the term community property at the top of page 40 also. Community property, of course, comes from Spain. So you got to be careful on the test, though. If the test asks, historically, all of our real estate laws in California come from where? English common law. The exception to that is community property. Community property, of course, is a holdover from Spain at the top of page number 40. Now, you've heard of community property. Of course, community property conceptually is when you get married, all of your stuff will shake down into one of two categories. It'll either be community property or separate property. Generally, and we'll talk about this more in chapter three, but generally the things that you acquire while you're married are generally split 50-50 between spouses. That does not come from England. That is a Spanish concept. So again, be careful on the test. If the test were to say, historically, all of our real estate laws come from English common law, the exception, of course, is this concept of community property. Community property is a holdover from Spain at the very top of page number 40. Now, another thing I would look at here at the bottom of page number 41 where it says population, just a quick update. Now, you are uh, looking at the most recent edition of our textbook, but I would draw your attention to the bottom of page number 41 where it talks about the median home values in California. Now, the median home prices today in early 2018, of course, are about $570,000 in California. That is very, very, very expensive. In fact, only 29% of California people could afford the median priced home because it's so, uh, it's so expensive, right? So again, the affordability index, which essentially is an index that measures the percentage of California residents that could afford the median priced home, that's at 29% right now. So from 2011 to 2018, property values uh, from that period have definitely skyrocketed, causing, again, the median home price to be near 570000 which creates a number for the affordability index at 29%. So we do have some challenges trying to make the American dream of home ownership possible for more people. But, uh, of course, rising home prices have not helped the number of people that could afford the median priced home. Now, if you look here on page number 42 at the bottom, you'll see two things at the bottom of page 42 that are worth noting. It says real property and personal property. So real property, of course, right underneath real property at the bottom of 42, I would write the words transferred by deed. So ownership of real estate is transferred using a deed. Personal property, of course, I would write the words transferred using bill of sale at the bottom of page 42. So one thing that's worth noting is that in all the world, everything in the world, from the shirt on your back to the desk that you might be sitting at, you're listening to this in your car, to your car, every single thing will fall into one of two categories. It'll either be real property or it'll be personal property. Now, here's a couple of ways to look at the differences between real and personal property. First, think about this. How do you say real estate in Spanish? El real estate. No, I'm just kidding. Real estate in Spanish is not El real estate. 
Real estate in Spanish is a term called bienes raices. Literally translated, bienes raices literally means goods or things that are rooted. Rooted objects or rooted things. So your house is rooted into the ground. It's been permanently attached to a foundation. Hence, your house is an example of real estate. A tree in your backyard, a 50-foot, 60-foot oak tree in your backyard, that oak tree is considered real estate because it's rooted into the ground. Even fruit growing on a tree in your backyard, well, the fruit's attached to the tree, the tree is attached to the ground, so the fruit is also real estate. Now, if you plucked all those oranges or pears or apples from the tree and put them in bushels, then those fruits become personal property because they're no longer permanently attached to the structure. So again, real estate has a characteristic of being immovable, which is again, real estate in Spanish, it literally translated into English means things that are rooted. Now, think about this at the bottom of 42 and the top of 43. Just that word property. Now, property as a concept could best be described as a bundle of rights. And you'll see this at the middle of 42 or the top of 43. Property could best be described as a bundle of rights. Now, think about your car. You own your car. What could you do with your car? Well, you could drive it. You could lend it to a buddy. You could paint it. You could sell it. You could enjoy it. You could exclude others from using it. So you have a whole host of things that you can do when you own anything. So property could best be described as a bundle of rights. Now remember, in all the world, there's only two types of property. There's real property and there's personal property. Real estate is transferred by deed. Personal property is transferred using a bill of sale. Now remember, anything that's not real estate is automatically personal property. And anything that's not personal property is automatically real estate. Because remember, everything in the world is going to fall into one of those two categories. At the middle of page 43, you'll see all these black squares at the middle of 43. These black squares are all examples of real estate. Now, if you look at that first black square, you'll see the term land. Land is an example of real estate. Now, what is it characteristically about land that makes land real estate? Well, land is immovable. Because land is immovable, land is considered real estate. Look at the next one. You'll see the term fixture. A fixture is also an example of real estate. Now, how would you define the word fixture? So a fixture is something that was once personal property, but now it's been attached in such a way that it has become a permanent part of the structure. I'll give you an example of this. A chandelier in a house. A chandelier is probably a fixture, mainly because the chandelier is permanently attached to the structure. Now you've seen in some older houses, you'll have a chandelier hanging on a hook and the hook is maybe, uh, the chandelier is plugged into an electrical outlet in the ceiling. That dangling chandelier that's not permanently attached to the ceiling is probably personal property and not considered a fixture, basically because it's not attached in such a way that it is now a permanent part of the structure. I'll give you another thing that's a fixture most likely. Uh, the carpet is a fixture. Drywall is a fixture. Windows are fixtures. Doors are fixtures. So some things are obviously fixtures, right? If you buy my house, you're going to get all the doors. The doors are fixtures. If you buy my house, you're going to get all the light bulbs and the carpet and the hardwood floors and the granite countertops and the cabinets. They're all fixtures because they've been attached in such a way that they're now a permanent part of the structure. But some things could be a little more ambiguous. I'll give you an example. Some things could be ambiguous, like uh, I just want a good friend of mine selling her house. She's also a real estate broker in uh, Beverly Hills, and she invited me over to dinner at her house because she just listed her home for sale. She, it had gone up a lot in value, and she did a lot of work to it, so she you know, wanted to lock in her profits and sell it. So we went to dinner, and on the way back to her house, she shows me this app on her phone. And uh, they're using this app my friend can basically control all the thermostats in her house. Now, 
She has a pretty big house. It's about 9,000 square feet in Beverly Hills. I think she's asking $11 million for the home. It's beautiful. But she has such a large home that the home actually needs five separate air conditioning units. And she can control each one of these five separate air conditioning units using her phone through this app. Very interesting. Now, she told me that each one of these thermostats were about $200 a piece. She spent $1,000 on thermostats before she listed the property for sale. Now, she's going to buy another home, and I'm sure she's probably going to want to take those thermostats with her to her next property. Question is, are those thermostats fixtures? That is, can she take them with her, or do they have to stay with the property because they're fixtures? That could be ambiguous. Now, if I was buying her house and I saw those five really nice Wi-Fi enabled thermostats, I would think, well, that's pretty cool. I can't wait to move into my house with these new Wi-Fi enabled thermostats. My friend might say, hey, I just put those up. I'm going to take them with me to my next property. Are those considered fixtures? You could see that could be ambiguous. Are blinds in a home considered fixtures? Are curtains considered fixtures? In fact, here's something interesting. My friend, uh, that's her house in Beverly Hills, she has the most wonderful entry, like foyer area that I've ever seen. She, her entry to her house is probably 900 to 1,000 square feet, just the entryway. It's very dramatic. She has a big fountain in her entryway, and the fountain is uh, surrounded by a koi pond. And there's about 10 koi fish floating around in that koi pond. Now, in the brochure she gave me, one of the selling points for the property, it said, wonderful koi pond in foyer. Now, if I bought her house, I might think, hey, you're, selling, you're saying that the house has a koi pond. You can't have a koi pond without koi fish. You got to leave the fish. The fish are fixtures. Now, her position might be, hey, those fish are pets of mine. I'm not going to leave you my fish, much, much like I wouldn't leave you my dog or my cat. Those fish can be taken with me. You could see that could be ambiguous. Or what about, a, what about a plasma or LED television mounted on the wall? Is the television considered a fixture? So anyway, I don't want to beat a dead horse here, but notice that it could be a source of some contention for a buyer and a seller where a buyer thinks that something in the home is a fixture and therefore should stay because fixtures are real estate, middle of 43. And the seller might say, hey, those are not in fact fixtures. They're personal property and I can take them with me. Either way, if it's a fixture, it's considered real estate, middle of 43. But the ambiguity and the problem arises in determining whether or not something is or is not a fixture. This could be the point of some contention. Look at the third word here, anything incidental or appurtenant to the land at the middle of 43. Now, and appurtenance, you might, you might want to write this down somewhere next to appurtenance at the middle of 43. Right next to appurtenance, I would write the words runs with land. And appurtenance is something that runs with or goes with the land. I'll give you an example of an appurtenance. Let's say you bought my farm. And on the farm exists a well. If you bought my farm, would I take the well with me or would it stay with the property? It stays with the property, right? The well is appurtenant to the land. You buy my house. Maybe my house has an easement where the guy, maybe I live in the front house. There's a guy in the back house. The only way the guy in the back can get home is to cross over my land. That's called an easement. Now, if you bought my home, would I take the easement with me to my next property or would it stay with the property? It runs with the land. It's a pertinent to the land. So here at the middle of page 43, real estate is land, fixtures, anything a pertinent to the land. What does a pertinent mean again? It means runs with or goes with the land or anything immovable by law, right? We talked about things that are rooted. Things that are rooted to the property are considered real estate. So again, here's the question you might find on the test. Putting it all together, examples of real estate include A, land, B, fixtures, C, appurtenances, D, any of the above. Your answer, any of the above, right? All of those are considered real estate here at the middle of page 43. In fact, clearly the land is real estate, bottom of 43, because land is immovable. How far below the surface of the land do you own? 
Well, if you look at the bottom of 43, you'll see reference to mineral rights and the top of 44. So ownership of real estate actually extends from the surface of the land all the way down to the core or center of the earth. Now, of course, underneath all your land are all sorts of minerals, oils, and gases that are swirling around. Now, those mineral, oil, and gas rights are also considered real estate. So if you buy 20 acres of land someplace and you happen to strike oil or find gold or copper, diamonds on your property, you're rich because those mineral, oil, and gas rights generally stay with the property all the way down to the core or center of the earth at the bottom of 43 and the top of 44. Now, with air rights at the bottom of 44, real estate generally will also have air rights, but the air rights aren't all the way down to the or all the way up to the moon, I should say. They're not that high. Air rights are those rights which you could reasonably use. So that's why airplanes flying over your building or flying over your land don't need some kind of airplane easement because you couldn't reasonably use that airspace 50,000 feet above above your property, right? So on the downside, right, ownership of real estate extends from the surface of the land all the way down to the core or center of the earth. The airspace is only that airspace which you could reasonably use. Now, if you look here on page number 45, you'll see on page 45 the term water rights. Now, I would write a couple things next to water rights. Now, there's actually four water-related vocabulary terms that we should know for our test on page 45. Now, there's one that's actually on the test but not in the book, and I want to give you those uh, water right terms right now. So the first thing I would write, because it's on the test potentially but not in the book, somewhere near this gray box, I would write the word potable, P-O-T-A-B-L-E, potable water. Now, potable water is drinking water. Water that you can consume is potable. You might say, why is drinking water a vocabulary question on my real estate test? And the reason is, is that some real estate agents sell farms. And if you sell a farm or a property on which exists a well, before that buyer starts pumping water out of that well and seeing if they can drink it, they should have the water tested for potability. So potable water, of course, is drinking water. And I know, side note, you might hear people tell you, ah, oh, you know, you take that real estate class. Don't, don't worry about the things that you hear in that real estate test. You'll never use them. Now, the reason that people say that, of course, is that the real estate exam tests you on a wide variety of real estate-related concepts. What that means is you could have some people selling businesses, some people selling farms, some people selling mineral rights, some people selling houses, some people doing commercial leasing. So the test kind of has, has to ask you questions from a wide spectrum of real estate related activity. And potable water is one of those terms. Well, if you're selling houses in you know San Diego, the potability of the water probably isn't something that you think about with any degree of regularity. But if you're selling strawberry farms in Central California or avocado farms near the Mexican border, this might be something that you'll have to advise your client about. Now, the three other water-related words we should know are here on page number 45. The first is the term riparian at the top of 45. Now, right next to riparian, I would write the word river. Then, next to littoral, I would write the word lake. Then, I'd circle the R's in river and the R's in riparian. And then, I'd circle the L's in littoral and the L in the word lake. So I'd know that riparian rights go with river, littoral rights go with lake. Here's what I mean by that. Let's say that you owned a home bordering a river. You have the right to reasonably use that river. That means you can swim in it, you can fish in it, you can bathe in it, you can boat in it. You can do whatever you want in that water as long as it doesn't affect your neighbor's riparian rights. Littoral rights are the same thing except this relates to people that own property bordering a lake. So if you own a property bordering a lake, you have the right to reasonably use that lake. Those rights are called littoral rights. So be very careful of the question on the test. The right of a property owner bordering a river to the reasonable use of the river could best be described as riparian. The right of a property owner bordering a lake to the reasonable use of the lake is littoral. Now, one clarification I feel compelled to make here is that with regard to riparian rights, Riparian rights honestly don't just mean river. It's any flowing body of water. What that means is 
river, stream, creek, brook. Any flowing waterway, those give you riparian rights. Any standing body of water, you'd have littoral rights. By standing body of water, I mean lake, sea, or ocean. So a flowing waterway, those are going to be riparian. A standing water course or body of water, that would be littoral. Now, the la true or false, riparian rights give the riparian owner absolute ownership and control of the water flowing past their land. No, it doesn't give you ownership and control. It just gives you use. Now, the last water term we should know, of course, is at the bottom of this gray box. It's the term appropriation. Now, appropriation is basically the right of a governmental entity, like the state, for example, to divert water for some public use. So does the government have the right to take water from one area and move it into an area affected by a drought? They do. And that right is called the right of appropriation. So be very careful of this question on the test, or these questions, right, because there's four of them. Water that is fit for consumption could best be described as potable water. The right of a property owner bordering a river to the reasonable use of the river is riparian. The right of a property owner bordering a lake to the reasonable use of the lake is littoral. And finally, the right of the government to collect and distribute water, of course, is known as the right of appropriation. So we talked at the bottom of page 45 about the word appurtenance. And an appurtenance is something that runs with or goes with the land. And we talked about that, of course, like an easement on a property, of course, would be an appurtenance. Because if you sold your property, it's not as though you take the easement with you. The easement stays with or runs with the land, right? And, of course, an appurtenance is also considered real estate. Now, I look at the top of page number 46, and you'll see the term emblement at the very top of page number 46. So an emblement is relating to the right of a tenant farmer to return to the land to harvest crops even after the lease expires. So an emblement right basically is the right of a tenant farmer to return to the land to harvest crops. Now, here's what I mean by tenant farmer. Now, if you close your eyes and you picture a farmer, do you picture the farmer owning the land or renting the land? I eat owning, right? I picture a farmer, you know, getting up at 4.30 in the morning to milk the cows and he or she's getting out of their barn and, you know, they'll go to till their corn or cotton field or whatever it is. So we generally think of a farmer as owning the land. However, in some instances, farmers actually rent the land, especially in like high value real estate areas, like let's say in Napa or Santa Barbara, for example, for winemaking. Let's say I own five acres or six acres of land and you want to lease that land from me to grow your grapes for your winemaking. Now, I'll do a deal. I'll, I'll lease the land to you for X thousand a month. And after that lease is up, if I want to run my own vineyard, because your lease has expired and you have no more options, an implement right would give you the right as a tenant farmer to continue to harvest the crops even after the lease expires. So an implement right is basically the right to cultivate crops. And this is typically a farmer concept, especially in the instance where you have a tenant farmer where the lease is ultimately expired. Now, we talked earlier, of course, about the tests for a fixture and whether or not something is or is not a fixture. Now, certain things we discussed are obviously fixtures, flooring, shan you know, big chandeliers permanently installed in the property, uh, plumbing pipes and faucets and drywall and uh, you know, ceiling tile in a big building. Those are all generally obviously fixtures, but some things can be ambiguous. Home theater equipment, for example. Maybe you sell a property and there's a large home theater in one of the rooms. You know, is that home theater componentry considered a fixture? Maybe they have a big movie theater like screen in the front of that home theater. Is that considered a fixture? Are the speakers considered fixtures? Is the wiring considered a fixture? So again, the point is, I don't want to beat a dead horse here, but you can see how in certain instances, whether or not something is or isn't a fixture can be some can be ambiguous. The law basically got so tired of hearing buyers and sellers fight about whether or not something is or isn't a fixture that the law on page 47 
has basically devised five tests to determine whether or not something is or isn't a fixture. Now, the nice thing about these five tests is that they can be remembered quite easily by the acronym MARIA at the top of page 47. So MARIA are the five tests to determine whether or not something is or isn't a fixture. Those five tests are method of attachment, adaptability, relationship of the parties, intention of the parties, and agreement of the parties. So again, these are the five tests to determine whether or not something is or isn't a fixture. And again, the acronym for this is MARIA, method of attachment, adaptability, relationship, intent, and agreement. So I'll give you an example of this. Let's say you're talking about a desk in an office. So maybe you're selling a house as a four bedroom home. One of the bedrooms has been converted into an office and there's a large oak desk that's maybe they, a nice one. Maybe they bought it from some fancy furniture store and it's a big oak desk in the room. Is that oak desk considered a fixture? Well, probably not, right? Because it's not attached, but we can prove it using the acronym MARIA. Now, Maria, of course, let's look at the desk or consider the desk. First, method of attachment. How permanently is that desk attached to the property? It's not. It's just kind of, you know, it's moved into the room and laid on there without being bolted to anything. So the desk probably is not a fixture, mainly because the desk is not a perm. It's not permanently attached. Look at the A, adaptability. Adaptability, of course, means can I use it somewhere else? How adaptable is this somewhere else? So for example, can I easily use that desk somewhere else? Yeah, I can probably easily use that desk somewhere else. So the desk is probably not a fixture. Now, the drywall in the room, the drywall is not very adaptable. You can't just use that drywall elsewhere. It's custom cut for that room. So the drywall probably is a fixture, whereas the desk probably isn't. Look at the third one, the R, relationship of the parties. Now, what this relates to is if the law or judge cannot determine whether or not it's a fixture, like it's just too close, well, between buyer and seller, the law will favor the buyer. That is, if it's dead even and the law cannot determine whether or not something is or isn't a fixture, between buyer and seller, the law will fall to favor the buyer. Between landlord and tenant, the law will favor the tenant. So let's say you're my tenant in my apartment building and you mount a plasma TV on the wall. Can I, as the landlord, come into your unit and say, hey, you put that TV on my wall, it's mine now. No, that TV is the property of you, the tenant. Between lender and borrower, the law will always favor the lender. That is, assume that I'm losing my home in foreclosure. Can I gut the house? take it down to the studs, take down all the copper, take all the chandeliers, take all the lights, take the toilets. I'm not allowed to do that because those fixtures have to stay to benefit the lender. Now, I know a lot of people did that through the recession where they, you know, 10 years ago when we were going through a pretty rough financial crisis in our country, in our state in particular, a lot of people did gut their house down to the studs, but that's not allowed. Strictly speaking, those fixtures have to stay with the property to benefit the lender. So again, our relationship of the parties between buyer and seller, the law favors the buyer. Between landlord and tenant, the law favors the tenant. And between lender and borrower, the law favors the lender. Now look at the I, intention of the parties. Was it the intent of whoever put that desk in that office? Remember, we're imagining an office in a home. Whoever put that desk in that office, was it intended to be a permanent part of the structure? Probably not, right? That's why it's not bolted down. So that item is probably not a fixture. Now, the most important one, perhaps, is probably the A, agreement of the parties. If you buy my house and you want the desk in my office to stay with the home, then all you got to do is put it in the contract. Now, my friend who was selling her house in Beverly Hills, if you want those custom thermostats, you can get them. Got to put them in the contract. If you want those koi fish, you can get them. You can negotiate for them. You just got to put it in the contract. Now, here's a question for you. You probably know this already, but who is the one who writes up all these real estate contracts? It's not a lawyer. It's not even an escrow company. It's you. 
you and I, as real estate professionals, we're the ones that create all of our contracts. Now, what that means is if you buy my, if let's say you represent a buyer and that buyer wants that home being sold by my friend in Beverly Hills and your buyer wants those koi fish, you got to put them in the contract. Now, how would you describe those koi fish? You don't want to just put seller to provide 10 fish for buyer because then the seller will go to the 99 Ranch Market, get 10 catfish, put those catfish in the tub, plug the tub and say, hey, there's your 10 fish. You want to say seller to provide 10 koi fish. Better yet, seller to provide 10 live koi fish. Seller shall provide 10 koi fish currently in koi pond ranging in sizes between X and Y and ranging in ages between Y and Z to be included with the sale of the property. So as a real estate professional, you want to be very specific and descriptive about those items that you want included or excluded because the contract is really ultimately all we have to go off of. So being very descriptive, extremely important as it relates to whether or not something is included or whether or not it's a fixture. So is a fixture real estate? Yeah, of course, it was on our list. Remember that list we had here on page number 43? Examples of real estate, of course, are land, fixtures, so fixtures are real estate, and anything appurtenant to the land. Remember, an appurtenance is something that runs with or goes with the land. So yes, a fixture is real estate. Now, there is one small exception to this at the bottom of 47 and the top of 48, and it, re is, it relates to trade fixtures. You'll see this term trade fixture, of course, at the very bottom of page 47 in italics. You'll see the term trade fixture. So a trade fixture, of course, is personal property. Now, let me give you an example of what a trade fixture actually is. So a trade fixture is a fixture that is used in the course of a business. And because a trade fixture is used in the course of a business, it is considered personal property, not real estate. So I'll give you an example of a trade fixture. Let's say that I own a large restaurant somewhere in San Francisco and I have a huge oven. And maybe I make pizzas in my restaurant. I have this huge, crazy, very powerful oven that can cook a pizza in like three minutes, right? Really fast. And this uh, restaurant's in San Francisco. My lease is up and I don't, the rent's go going up too much. I want to relocate my restaurant from, let's say, San Francisco to Oakland. Now, that oven is pretty big. It might be eight feet high and it might weigh, you know, 2,000 pounds or whatever it is. But because that oven is used in the course of a business, it's considered personal property, not real estate. So ownership of a trade fixture, of course, trade fixtures are personal property. Because it's personal property, remember, it's transferred using a bill of sale. So a fixture, just the word fixture by itself, a fixture is, of course, real estate. If you put the word trade in front of the word fixture, though, a trade fixture is a fixture that is used in the course of a business and is therefore considered personal property, not real estate. So got to be careful on the test. If you see the word fixture alone on the exam, a fixture is, of course, real estate. You throw the word trade in front of it. A trade fixture is personal property. And ownership of a trade fixture, of course, would then be transferred using a bill of sale. So remember back in the day, Mervyn, Circuit City, you know, all these uh, Borders books, all these stores that closed the last few weeks, not only were they selling their merchandise a little cheaper, what else were they selling? All the fixtures and the shelving off the wall because those are trade fixtures and are personal property used in the course of a business. And the presumption, of course, is that those belong to the tenant. So let's look here at the bottom of page 48, because this chapter is really in two sections. One is the differences between real and personal property and, you know, water rights and all those things we just spoke about. And the last part of the chapter, of course, is about land description on 48 and 49. So land description, every piece of real estate for it to be sold, it must be adequately described, right? So every piece of real estate must be adequately described. What does described mean? Described, of course, means that you must have a way to identify the parcel. Now, a lot of people incorrectly think that a way to identify the parcel would be, let's say, an address. But actually, an address is not considered a legal description. And the reason that the address is not considered a legal description, of course, is because not every piece of real estate in California actually has an address. 
In fact, most pieces of real estate in California don't have an address. And that might sound ambiguous or confusing or false to you, but the truth is the majority of land in California does not have an address. The majority of land in California is still quite rural. Now, I know if you live in like San Diego or Orange County or LA or Ventura County or, you know, the Bay Area, you might think, man, there's traffic everywhere. But there's a lot of land in California and a lot of California that is not yet developed. So land must be adequately described. An address is not considered a legal description because A, a lot of properties don't have addresses. And B, sometimes addresses can be ambiguous. I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. Let's say you look at a big street like Pacific Coast Highway, for example, in California. Now, PCH, you could have a 1601 PCH in La Jolla, a 1601 PCH in, let's say, Hermosa Beach, a 1601 PCH in Carmel, 1601 PCH in the Bay Area. So addresses don't always exist on every piece of real estate, A. And B, even if every property had an address, addresses can sometimes be ambiguous on very, very large, long streets. So we need a way to describe property without using an address. And in fact, there are three ways of legally describing real estate. And you'll see these three ways at the top of page 49. These three ways are meets and bounds, the rectangular survey system, also known as the U.S. government survey system or township system. And then number three, of course, is lot and block. So these are the three ways to legally describe real estate, meets and bounds, a rectangular survey system, and lot and block. Now, we'll start, of course, this discussion with meets and bounds at the bottom of page number 49. Basically, how a meets and bounds description would work, meets and bounds would say, for example, start at the tree. From the tree, travel 200 feet north until you see a stake in the ground. From the stake in the ground, travel 100 feet east until you see the large black boulder. From the black boulder, travel 200 feet south until you hit the northern edge of the stream. And from the stream, travel 100 feet west to the point of origin. This is a meets and bounds method of land description. Now, you can imagine you don't see real estate agents in San Francisco or in L.A. or in Newport Beach running around with compasses and rulers trying to figure out property boundaries. We use something called lot and block in urban and suburban areas. But when would you have to use a meets and bounds method of land description? Well, you'd probably have to use a meets and bounds method of land description when you have, and you might want to write this down, of course, uh, at the bottom of 49, when you have an irregularly shaped rural parcel. So when you have an irregularly shaped rural parcel, you're basically forced to use the meets and bounds method of land description. You would also use a meets and bounds method on property that has no tract map recorded. Now, what's a tract map? A tract map is basically like a subdivision map where property boundaries have been drawn and you know you have everything kind of chopped up quite easily and quite cleanly. In urban and suburban areas, you have tract maps for everything, right? Every property has boundaries. But when you're talking about the middle of nowhere, like let's say a place called Yermo, Maybe you've been to Yermo. That's where if you drive to L.A. back from Vegas, there's an agricultural checkpoint to see if you, you know, to see if you have any Nevada bananas that you brought back illegally from Vegas. That's Yermo. If you buy 20 acres of land in Yermo, you don't really need or have a tract map yet because there's no subdivision map out there. It's way too rural. However, if you bought 20 acres of land in Yermo, you would still have to legally describe it. You're going to use a meets and bounds method of land description where you use natural and artificial markers to delineate your property boundary. Now, one other thing I would note next to meets and bounds at the bottom of 49 is I'd write the words would show user perimeter. The meets and bounds method of land description would show the user the perimeter of a lot. However, meets and bounds will not show the user the topography of a lot. Now think of that word topography. What does that word topography mean? Well, topography is really just the lay of the land. Topography is going to show you like elevation. So if I say, you know, start at the tree and go 200 feet north, 
you know generally what direction you're going to be going in, but you don't know whether or not that's going to be up or down or whether it's going to be hilly or flat is what I mean by that. So meets and bounds will show the user the perimeter of a lot as we circumscribe the lot. However, meets and bounds will not show the user the topography of a lot. We know what direction we're going to be traveling in, but we don't know whether that's going to be, you know, hilly or flat. We don't necessarily know elevation by reading a meets and bounds method of land description. So again, we have three ways to legally describe property. The three ways to legally describe property are meets and bounds, rectangular survey, and lot and block. Which one would we use on irregularly shaped rural parcels? Meets and bounds. Which one would we use in an area that we don't have a tract map recorded for? Meets and bounds. We would use the rectangular survey system or also called the U.S. government survey system or township system on very, very large parcels at the bottom of 51. So we would use this on like 20, 40, 100, 200, 300 acre pieces of land, big farms. We would use the rectangular survey system also called the U.S. government service system or township system. Now let's look here then on page number 52 about the California township and range survey system. So as I mentioned, the purpose of the U.S. government survey system, also called the rectangular survey system, is basically to describe large parcels of land without necessarily using a uh, address. So Basically, a long time ago, the government wanted to grid the entire state of California and break the state down into sections and townships. Now, in order to get the state gridded in this fashion for sections and townships, surveyors basically needed starting points for the survey. Surveyors drew an east-west line and called it a baseline. Surveyors also drew a north-south line and called this a meridian line. Now, you'll never see a meridian line without a baseline, and you'll never see a baseline without a meridian line. They always go together. Now, because of the peculiar shape of California, California actually needed three base and meridian lines in order to get the grid formed. Now, if you look at page 52, you'll see the northernmost base and meridian line called the Humboldt base and meridian. Below that, near San Francisco, we have the Mount Diablo base and meridian line. And of course, near Los Angeles in the Inland Empire, we have the San Bernardino base and meridian line. So again, the way to remember this, of course, is the H in Humboldt for H in highest, the M in Mount Diablo and the M in the word middle, and then of course the S in San Bernardino and the S in the word south. So Humboldt, Mount Diablo, and San Bernardino. Now, what's well, let me give you a question you might find on the test about this. It might say, for example, which of the following is not a recognized base and meridian line in California, A, Humboldt, B, Mount Diablo, C, San Bernardino, or D, Mount Wilson? Your answer, Mount Wilson, is not a recognized base or meridian line in California. Now, from the intersection of this base and meridian line, because remember, the purpose of these base and meridian lines are simply starting points for the survey. These base and meridian lines basically form the starting points for our grid. Because ultimately, we need to grid the entire state of California in order to break the state down into these squares so we can describe our larger parcels of land. So again, from the intersection of a baseline and meridian line, every six miles, they drew other lines called range lines and township lines. Now, these range and township lines, the names aren't important. But what is important to remember is that these are at six mile intervals. So every six miles from the intersection of a range and township line, surveyors drew other lines, right? These are, again, range and township lines. Now, you can see that we have this grid that started to form. These squares are called townships. So again, a township is basically a square where each side of the square is six miles. So this collection of like six by six squares called townships. Now, no matter how big my farm is, no matter how big my land is, a six mile by six mile square is pretty big. It won't really help describe where I live if I tell you I live inside some huge six mile by six mile box. 
this township needs to be cut into smaller squares called sections. Now at the top of page 54, you'll see that there are 36 sections in a township. And notice at the top of 54 that the numbering of these sections in a township are actually quite uh, illogical, right? You might normally think that section one would be in the top left corner of the township. And the numbering would go from left to right, left to right, left to right, like you would read, right? Like you're reading a page from left to right. But actually, the numbering of sections in a township is actually a little, a little different. Section one is located at the top right. Now, of course, on a map, top right is going to be the northeast. And the numbering goes from east to west, west to east, east to west, west to east. And it kind of snakes around until section 36 is in the south east corner of a township. So notice section one is in the northeast again, and the numbering is going from east to west, west to east, east to west, west to east, and it's kind of snaking around until section 36 is in the southeast corner of a township. Now, again, if you're selling real estate in urban or suburban areas like Los Angeles or Oakland or San Francisco or Orange County, it would be pretty unlikely that you'd be looking at sections and townships. But again, if you're selling farmland in Northern California or in Central California, you might sell the north half of section four in a given township. You might sell the northeast quarter of section eight in a township. So if you're in a rural area or you're in an area where farm brokerage is quite common, you might frequently be dealing with sections and townships. Now, here's a question for you. If you look at the chart here at the top of 54, how about this question you might find on the test? Section three is located directly north of what section? Well, three is north of section 10. Section three is located directly south of what section? 34. Because remember, there's no section 34 in the same township, but remember, it's a grid. So you have townships all around. So section 34 is north of section 3 in the northern township. Now, in reference to, well, let me ask you this. What's bigger, a section or a township? Section, right? Because a section is the smaller square. The township, of course, is the larger square. The big six mile by six mile box, that's a township. The smaller squares inside of it, of course, are known as sections. Now, one thing that we should know here, and you might want to write this somewhere on page number 54 at the top, I would write the words one section equals 640 acres. One section equals 640 acres. So section three contains how many acres? 640. Section six contains how many acres? 640. They all contain 640. How about this? The north half of section 13 contains how many acres? Well, the north half, well, the half of a section, half of 640 is going to be 320. So the north half of section whatever is 320 acres. How about this? The north half of the east half of section 6 contains how many acres? That sounds complicated, but it's really just asking what's half of a half. Half of a half is a quarter. So a quarter of 640 is going to be 160. So a quarter section contains 160 acres. So you get the idea, right? So you can see how large, when you reference sections and townships with the rectangular service system, you can really see how large these parcels are. The section is 640 acres. Half of a section is 320. Even a quarter section is still 160 acres. So we use the rectangular survey system or the U.S. government survey system, same thing. We use this method of land description on very, very large parcels of real estate, right? We're talking farms in Central California. That's when we would use uh, big development projects might be referenced in terms of sections and townships. Now, in civilization, if you look here at the middle of 56, in urban and suburban areas, really the preferred method of land description is going to be the lot and block method of land description. So, in fact, you might write that at the middle of 56 for the test. Right next to lot and block, I would write the words most useful. The most useful method of land description is going to be the lot and block method. And the reason that the lot and block method is most useful is because 
in the lot and block method, every parcel of real estate is assigned something called an assessor's parcel number. And you might want to write those words assessor's parcel number here at the middle of page number 56. So every parcel of real estate that is in a subdivision is subject to a assessor's parcel number. This is where the property is assessed a lot, block, and track number. So maybe you've been to a model home or new home community and you walk into the sales office and you see a large model of the neighborhood and you see all these monopoly looking pieces and you're like, oh honey, I wanna buy lot 15, look at how big that lot is. Or I wanna buy lot 19, look at how close that is to the ocean. That lot number is part of an assessor's parcel number or an APN. So every parcel of real estate is going to have a parcel number that uniquely identifies that particular piece of real estate. So for example, my house might have a parcel number of like 45-121-00-2. So that parcel number is unique to my home. No other property anywhere in California is gonna have that same parcel number. Now, if you're in an irregularly shaped rural parcel of land, you'd have meets and bounds. If you're talking about huge parcels of real estate, we'd use lot and block or the rectangular survey system. If you're talking about a regular house in Irvine or in San Francisco, you'd use the lot and block method because it would have its own unique parcel number. So now, by the way, my house, let's say I live in LA, my house in LA, I could theoretically describe my house using meets and bounds. I could, you know, hammer little pink stakes at every corner and, you know, or use latitude and longitude lines to describe where my property is. But I wouldn't do that, right? My parcel would be described using the lot and block method of real estate. If we're talking about huge parcels of land, 60, 120, 320, 640 acres, we'd use the rectangular survey system. If we're talking about an irregularly shaped rural parcel where no track map has been recorded, we'd use meets and bounds. So remember, for real estate to be transferred, it must be adequately described. An address is not a legal description. There's only three ways to legally describe real estate, meets and bounds, U.S. government survey, also called the rectangular survey system, and lot and block. That concludes chapter two. We will catch you guys in a little bit for chapter three.